Welcome to the Blue Ridge Baptist Church YouTube channel. It's brought to you by the folks here at Blue Ridge Baptist Church, and we pray you receive a special blessing while spending the time here with us. And to God be the glory. As the scriptures say, you know, such were some of you. Such were some of you, but God. And thank God that this, this text we've been looking at here in Ephesians, Thank God for the position and the place that we have in Jesus Christ our Lord. And even more wonderfully as we've looked at, at where this all began in eternity past. And we're going to continue on looking this morning. I'm just going to read uh, verses 3 through 6 and continue on with where I was last week or two weeks ago. And I'll review a few things. But y'all ought to have this memorized by now. <laughs> I have. <laughs> <clears throat> Verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ, according as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of His grace, wherein He hath made us accepted in the Beloved. I said a few weeks ago that little phrase, the praise to the glory of His grace. That's mentioned three times down through verses 14, down in verse 12, down in verse 14. And uh, that is significant, what we're talking about today, to the praise of the glory of His grace. It's all for His glory, this whole thing that He began in eternity past. You know, we've been hearing this text now for a couple of weeks. Uh, in the two previous lessons, I introduced the text with the emphasis being placed upon the quantity of the riches that are contained therein and the importance that from time to time we return to these things and be reminded of just how rich we are in Jesus Christ our Lord. These are our roots of who and what we are in Christ. God's great plan for the body of Christ, the church that was formed in eternity past. You know, some say, I've said each time I've introduced this, some say that it's the richest con concentration of doctrine found in the Bible right there in those first 14 verses. We've been looking at the forming of the body, the church. And last week we, we began by speaking of the significance of the body that we've been made a part of and how it is that God has gloriously uh, put this together by His planning, His power, His wisdom, and it's His purpose in Jesus Christ our Lord. Now, this is a big deal. I mean, this is this is huge, and we're a part of it. Uh, maybe I'm just being a cheerleader. I heard a preacher get up here once, and he said, I might not get anything else done, but I'm going to get up here and brag on our Lord for a little bit, brag on Jesus. So that's a that's a good thing to do. But we saw that as uh, Christians, as a member of the church, of this body, that we have a common source of life. We have a common kind of life, and we have a common destiny. You know, we all came in through that sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Uh, that We all possess that same divine nature. We might not act like it all the time, but He lives in us if we're saved. That nature's there. We're all partaking of that nature. Uh, we're all one in a marvelous and a unique way. You know, there's a unity in the church that's more than just a unity of a, a common agreement on a philosophy or a religion. There's a unity in the body of Christ. And that unity is a commonness of life. Uh, we're tied together in and by Him. By Jesus Christ. You know, speaking of that unity, I'm repetitive here, but over in Ephesians chapter 4 verse 13, it tells us, till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. You know, there's a, there's a basic unity, I said last time, not in faith, but in the faith the content of the gospel. There is a basic unity. What we just read, and it says, and of the knowledge of the Son of God. That, that, that it means uh, intimacy of, of knowing Him, not just knowing about Him. Um, but many times through the Scriptures, uh, we hear it spoken of, well, uh, Mary had said that she had never known a man. We know what that means. That's an intimacy, an intimate relationship. That is that knowledge that He has of us. 
We often hear foreknowledge, his foreknowledge. That's what that means, that, that intimacy that he already had with us from the foundation of the world, didn't it? It didn't surprise him. He knew, he knew us. Uh, he, he knew all of, he didn't just know us. He intimately knew us. And so we all come in through that same basic content. And we all come into the knowledge of the same person, the Son of God. And we're all moving, just as what we just read, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. And God's working on us. You know, He's, I'm going to talk about that in depth at, towards the end of this, of just how He's putting this thing together. You know, how it, it is so, uh, precision. You know, the way that he is working and, and moving and, and fitting and doing, you know, and building. It, it's just wonderful, this unity that we have. <clears throat> but this unity we have, unity that we have in the church as the body, it's an absolute necessity. That's his intention. That's the way it's supposed to be. God's purpose for the body is that would, it would manifest Christ in the world. And that in doing so, that he would receive the glory for it. That's his purpose. You know, it's important that we understand and that we're reminded that we are one in Christ. And if we really get a hold on these truths in these first three chapters where we, the church, originates and where we're headed, we can then move to practice what Paul's speaking of in the last three chapters, our walk. You know, the foundation is here in these first three chapters and even more so there in verses 3 through 14 that we've been spending so much time in. You know, in accordance with God's eternal purpose in Jesus Christ, we are involved in the manifestation of Christ individually and corporately to a lost and dying world. We all know that we're to be a light, a light to this earth. You know, we're soft at times, but God wants to use us and it's all for His glory. And it's all tied to that unity of the body. We must be uh, as one in Christ. And last week we began to look at, or two weeks ago, we began to look at uh, seven aspects listed in our text. Excuse me. Concerning this concept of election. And they were the method, the object, the time. The purpose, the motive, the result, and the reason. And we spent the remainder, remainder of that last class talking about that first one, the method. You might recall what we call sovereign election or sovereign selection that he chose. You know, our text says in verse 4, as he hath chosen. And right here we're introduced to the method by which God formed his body in eternity past. You know, it's simple, independent unaffected, sovereign choice. God just, he simply chose. It doesn't get any simpler than that. He chose. And by sovereign will, by sovereign decree, he chose those who were to be the members of his body. And and this was totally apart from the will of any man, totally apart from any uh, human consideration. Uh, It was purely on the basis of his own will. I commented the last time about the meaning of this We always throw this word around sovereign. And again, it means a person who has supreme power or authority, not subject to the rule or control of another. It stresses the absence of a superior power, and it implies supremacy within a thing's own domain or sphere. I often quote Genesis 1.1, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. It don't get no bigger than that. He is the sovereign of the universe, and there is no other. The, the Not Vladimir Putin or the guy leading China or even the government of the United States. We're sovereign in our own government. But as far as the world things go, he's the one that's sovereign. He's in control of all things. And we talked about that word chosen that was used there in verse 4, and it was the Greek word eklego, and it means to pick out for himself. And we saw that that means literally to select out, to single out, or choose out of. And the idea of that word, eklego, it speaks of the sizable number from which the selection's made. And it implies the taking of a smaller number from that vast large number. God chose for himself those that would be a part of his family. And, And you and I, who are part of the body of Christ, who know and love the Lord Jesus, who are in his church, who've been saved, born again, you know, we're just simply responding to that divine decree. 
of the eternal God that he made before the world began. You know, everybody was master planned in because, you know, think of this. Everybody was master planned in because there is a vital area of responsibility for each one of us. You know, we're going to fit somewhere. He wants us to. He has bought us in and fit us in just right. You know, like a a, a mason building a wall or something. You know, go, go fit. And, and there's a unique purpose which God has designed in his own love to place upon us, you know, some special and eternal blessing. And we did. We talked about the human responsibility thing some too. Again, Isaiah chapter 55 verse 1 says, Ho, everyone that thirsteth, come ye to the waters. And he that hath no money, come ye, buy and eat. Yea, come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. You know, we couldn't, we didn't have anything to bring, to buy anything. Revelations twenty two seventeen tells us, And the Spirit and the bride say, Come, and let him that heareth say, Come, and let him that thirst and who's, a come, and whosoever will, let him take of the water of life freely. He chooses individuals to salvation. And like Brother Ralph and I was talking our Thursday night after the service, you know, the whosoever will, they will come. You know, the chosen are going to come. John chapter 6, verse 44, and this is kind of moving on now, but it tells us that no man can come to me except the Father which hath sent him, sent me, draw him and I'll raise him up at the last day. And you know that word draw, the Greek word is helko. And, and it means simply to drag. Uh, and it's used now, it's not like the caveman dragging somebody by their hair. But <laughs> I don't want to, like Brother Art used to say, I don't want to turn loose more snakes here than I can catch. But... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but you know, but get this, it's used in the ancient pagan writings to speak of an irresistible force. And 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 and, and the example of that, uh, even some pagan writers, they use the word to speak of a hungry man being drawn to food. You know, have an appetite, you know, it's uh, you drawn to it as if by a magnet. It's used of the power of love that draws two people irresistibly together. That attraction that drawing and it's a force that's firm and it's compelling and it's a force that is wielded by the lord god almighty you know when he calls a man when he quickens their understanding and begins to work in them and that, and that he creates that appetite to come to him and it's, it's wonderful it's great but <clears throat> john chapter 6 verse 37 says all that the father giveth me shall come to me Oh, and get this, and him that cometh to me, I will in no wise cast out. Now, the next aspect of this election is the object. And it's obvious now that the object of this election is us. I mean, it's already told us here, but uh, uh, pretty much anything that could be preached probably been preached from the Word of God. You might say, well, this is awful repetitive or whatever, but that's how we learn. Yeah, these things need to stay fresh in our heart. Uh, he's chosen us in Him. He's chosen us to be in Christ. The us, they're the faithful that's spoken of. The us are the ones who believe. The us are the ones who will respond. Nobody will ever get to heaven who does not willfully, consciously submit himself in obedience to God. Now, he's going to put that appetite there, but that's got to happen. We've got to come unto him. There must be a response. Jesus said to the hard-hearted Jews, I mean, they thought they knew a lot about it. And he said to them in John chapter 5, verse 39, he said, search the scriptures, for in them ye think ye have eternal life, and they are which testify of me. And ye will not come to me that ye might have life. What he was saying is your religion ain't going to get it. Yeah, he, he said, it's got to be a lot more to it than that. Just you knowing about me or knowing about the Father or knowing about his word, that's not going to get it. So there must be a coming, and the us will come. That's us, you know, the chosen. You know, we were his before the world began, and uh, we were the inheritors of his kingdom before the world began. Uh, we were the choice to be in the Father's house forever before the world began. And now by the time you get through these first three chapter, chapters and this sinks in, um, you know, Paul, he's going to exhort us. It's not just a suggestion, but he's going to 
exhort us that we ought to live like it. You know, according to what we've learned right here, we ought to live like it. Over in chapter 4, verse 11, it says, Therefore the prisoner of the Lord beseech you, or I therefore the prisoner of the Lord beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called. You know, if we know anything uh, of so great a salvation and such a high calling, then we certainly, we're going to be in agreement with what Paul says here. That's a cause for praise. Uh, no wonder Paul said to begin what we've been looking at, blessed be the God. You know, it's all of him that he has chosen us. We are the object of his election. Let that sink in. The object, you know, that he looked down through eternity and chose us, that we were the object of such love and affection towards us. And, and the next thing we see here is the time of the election. I told Brother Ralph I had more to say than I know I'm going to have time to say, but he said, well, maybe that's better to do it that way, but I don't know if I'll get to the end of it or not. But, you know, we already know this, and we just saw it. It says, according as he hath chosen us in him, and when? Before the foundation of the world. That's going way back, and that's mind-boggling. You know, before anything ever was, you know, in theology, yeah, we call it that word predestination or election. And before the fall, before creation, before time, you know, before anything, God laid it all out. And it says here that he formed the body before the world began. Hey, that's, I said this is a big deal. The, this object, the church, it's wonderful. Over in Matthew chapter 25, verse 34, Jesus said, Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. First Peter chapter 1, verses 18, the familiar text here. It says, For as much as ye know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation, received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot, who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you. So the body, it was formed before the world began. And we, the church, they who are in Christ, we were given a place at that time before the world began. Christ was crucified, as it were, before the world began in the mind of God. It was a done thing. The whole master plan is simply being worked out, and we're a part of it as he's moving through this thing. You know, in speaking of the time of election, often I think of the big picture of God's plan being being carried out. This thing that started, our minds really can't grab at uh, eternity past. But, you know, the big picture that we've been uh, looking at over these past few lessons, it's been uh, the eternal purpose of God in Jesus Christ our Lord. You know, in light of this taking place before the foundation of the world in eternity past, I often think of his timetable in bringing these events uh, to pass, bringing his plan to pass and nothing being left to chance, nothing being left to chance. Uh, I think of how he's worked through history as it's recorded in the scriptures. It's wonderful. And in and, and record of it's not just confined to the scriptures. Now many of you are students of history. I am myself, uh, some parts of it more than others. But you see God working uh, throughout history. Just major events, the least little turn of something could have just changed everything and he let it run a, a certain path for his purpose. You know, he's been at work in secular history, bringing his plan to pass. You know, just this past Thursday evening, uh, Pastor Ralph, he preached on the faith of Rahab, the harlot, who hid those spies in Jericho. And I liked what Brother said. She was saved before them men got there. And uh, in a sense, she was. But why would she have done that? But uh, God could have easily protected those spies any, any way he saw fit. But you know, he wanted them there. He had a plan for her. And God in his sovereign providence, he wanted them there for the salvation of this harlot, Rahab. Uh, she would provide an example of his saving by faith a woman at the very bottom of the social strata. 
at the very bottom. That God had a plan for her that, that she be included in the earthly lineage of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Uh, what a privilege and what a blessing. Um, and that's recorded in the gene- genealogy of Christ found in Matthew chapter 1. Verse 5 says, And Salmon begat Boaz of Rahab, and Boaz begat Obed of Ruth. And Obed begot Jesse, and Jesse begot David the king, and David the king begot Solomon of her that had been the wife of Urias. Uh, wow. You know, there in those first five verses, we see uh, back-to-back two Gentile women in the lineage of Christ, Rahab the Canaanite woman and, and Ruth the Moabitess. Um, we see God at work. This, this plan from eternity past, and he's carrying it right down through the ages. Not by chance, but according to his plan and to his purpose. And by the way, you know, we aren't any different from Rahab and Ruth. Well, not, not one bit. Uh, we too have played the role. I don't want to hurt nobody's feelings or insult you, but this is according to the word of God. You know, we too, we've played the role of the harlot and chasing after other gods that are not gods and chasing after the cares of this world. We certainly have. Uh, we too are like Ruth the Moabitess. We're a stranger and a foreigner with no entitlement to the things of God. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 12 says, Paul said that at that time ye were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope without God in the world. Had not God in his providence yet no, according to his intricate plan, sent someone into our lives. Uh, ain't that true in all of us? Yeah, had not him in, in his providence sent somebody into our lives, maybe not even just to tell us, but to live it before us, that we saw, hey, this is real. You know, it's something to it. You remember Naomi, Ruth's mother-in-law? Oh, yeah, to me, Naomi's the star of that book of Ruth. You know, that, yeah, that she said, you know, my God's, you, your God's gonna become my God. I'm gonna forsake everything. I'm going home with you. Yeah. And, and, but God sent somebody into our lives to steer us in the direction of Christ. And if not, we'd have been left in Moab, far away from having anything to do with God. You know, had God not intervened in our lives, we'd have been left in our whoredoms in the ruins of that wall of Jericho just buried there, soul eternally lost. Had it not been for God and his plan. Again, in verse 13 of Ephesians chapter 2, it says, But now in Christ Jesus, you who sometime were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. And none of this is by chance. None of it. It's all according to his plan. You know, relative to God bringing his plan to pass in time, I often think of the earthly ministry of our blessed Lord concerning this plan made in eternity past. It's not a time I don't read through a gospel when I come across some of these statements. Uh, several times in the gospels it's said of Jesus or, or, or he said himself and my hour has not yet come. Oh, it was ticking. I mean, it wasn't no surprises. <laughs> no. Uh, in John chapter 2, verse 4, you remember he said to his own mother, Jesus said unto her, Woman, what have I to do with thee? Mine hour is not yet come. In John chapter 7, verse 30, it says, Then they sought to take him. He had so infuriated the Pharisees and the Jews. They, had, they sought to take him, but no man laid hands on him because his hour was not yet come. In Chapter 8, verse 20 of John, it says, These words spake Jesus in the treasury as he taught in the temple. And no man laid hands on him, for his hour was not yet come. But then, over in Luke chapter 9, verse 51, it goes on to say, And it came to pass, when the time was come that he should be received up, he said his... He steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem. I, I, I often, I, I do, I think of that. He set his face like a flint to go take on the devil and hell and everything. I mean, he was headed there. And then he said to his disciples in John chapter 12, verse 23, and Jesus answered them saying, The hour is come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Then in his high priestly prayer in John chapter 17, verse 1, 
it tells us these words spake Jesus and lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour is come. Glorify thy son that thy son also may glorify thee. You know, at that very instance, I often, I think of how it's, he's speaking to the father. The father, the hour has come. And I think of that counsel back in eternity past. All that had been planned back our way back. And, and here it is. The hour has come. Uh, you know, I've, I remember brother Art preaching. He's probably not the only one to preach it. But you, can you imagine the time that he was on a cross? He said, I believe if it had ever been silence in heaven, it was then. Yeah, as they beheld the Son of God dying for our sins. The sins of the world being placed upon Him. You know, God's timetable's been and still is moving right along according to His plan. And you know, for the us, there are, uh, we have a lot of appointments along the way. And, and some of our appointments are, are or will be relatively insignificant in terms of eternity. Oh, but some's going to be of vital importance. Uh, time's ticking along. It's, it's moving along. Just like I spoke of this man this morning being taken off life support. You know, in his mind, he probably knows that, yeah, that day would come, but, you know, the other day or a couple of weeks ago, whatever, just have a freak kind of accident and bang your head on something. Or this fellow right down the street here, his own son comes in and kills him. Uh, time's ticking along, you know, in eternity. We're getting closer and closer each day. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27 through 28 says, It's appointed unto men once to die, but after this, the judgment. So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. You know, I don't know how each of you fit into uh, God's eternal purpose and plan of redemption, and perhaps you aren't personally sure of, of how you fit in according to these these high things that we've been looking at here the last several weeks. But, you know, let me assure you, that we have an invitation here. Uh, but Paul gives a passionate exhortation in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 2. For he saith, I have heard thee in a time accepted, and in the, in the day of salvation have I succored thee. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. You know, what a, a, don't put that thing off. Time's ticking right along in God's eternal plan. But it's a glorious and a marvelous thing that God includes, includes us to be a part or a piece of that body. And again, it's, it's no light thing. You know, he is intricately and meticulously composing the church, the bride of Christ. And that church, it's precious. It's precious to our Lord. Uh, this introduces us to this next, next aspect of the election in eternity past, and that's the purpose, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. <clears throat> you know, some men disagree as to whether or not this text is referring to our justification, or our judicial standing, or is it talking about our ongoing sanctification or our walk? Uh, and I was surprised at who said what about it, you know. And they both had, you know, good points that they based it on. But given the context, I believe it's referring to our justification. Uh, this refers to Christ's imputed righteousness that's granted to us. Uh, and that's what I believe uh, and from what I've studied and gathered. Uh, it's a perfect righteousness which places us, places believers in a holy and blameless position before God. Philippians chapter 3 verse 9 tells us, And be found in him not having mine own righteous, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. Now we know on the other side of that, we know that our daily living falls far short of his holy standard. We know that. We experience it if you're honest. But again, given the context of the verse, I believe it's here speaking of our position or our standing in Christ. Remember the whole first three chapters have to do with our standing, our position and where that originated from. And there is an ongoing moving towards holiness as we grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord. And, you know, referring to our walk on over in chapter 5, you know, what we just read, that we would be holy and without blame. But on over in chapter 5, verse 25, it says, uh, 
he uses this analogy. He said, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church, and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with, wa- with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. Holy and without blemish. You know, that work's been completed, but yet he's still working on us. He is. Uh, God's currently in the process of composing or painting his masterpiece, and that's brought me up to the end of this, and I'm about run out of time here. He has the plan. He has the vision. And he knows every little detail, and he cares about how it's coming together. Believe me, he cares greatly how it's coming together. You know, over in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, and it's just too good for me just to whack it off, brother. I'll be just a couple minutes. It says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. You know, the church is God's masterpiece. Think about that. Uh, we are a piece of God's masterpiece. When it says workmanship, the Greek word there is po- poemo, and it means something that is composed or constructed, something that is made, that which is manufactured, a product, the thing made, a design produced by an artisan. That's the word used there, for we are his workmanship. And it means any work of art. It could mean a statue, a song, or architecture, a poem, or a painting. And it conveys the idea of something artfully created. That's where we get the word poem from, you know, that it's been composed, put together. In the Septuagint, I reckon how you pronounce that, is that right? You know, the Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible, that word there refers to God's work in creation. David said in Psalm 143, verse 5, he said, I remember the days of old. I meditate on all the, thy works. I muse on the works of thy hands. You know, there was an ancient Greek writer, Herodotus, and he records the use of this word poemo in classic writings to describe the work of a craftsman, such as somebody making a crown. Uh, you know, learning these definitions here concerning this workmanship, that was a blessing to me. It really was. David said, I muse on the work of thy hands. And I thought about our Lord as a skilled artisan putting together this body of Christ. And I have an appreciation for that, you know, for that, for being an artisan or a, a skilled laborer. Uh, it's something that many of you guys can relate to. You know, artisans used to describe somebody who works with their hands or in a skilled trade. And then there's artists and someone who works in the arts, such as painting or sculpting, writing or music. And these are closely related in, and they're closely related in that they both originate in the mind. And then they are conveyed into something material by the hands. David said, I muse at the work of thy hands, speaking of our Lord. You know, some of you men, uh, you build. I know Owen, he fabricates stuff. Chris is a carpenter. Some of you, you know, you're always building or doing stuff. And you have a vision or a plan for where you're headed. And, you know, as you're working along and you're seeing it come together, you're massaging on this thing. And, and every now and you stand back and admire your work and say, man, it's coming along pretty good. You know, I, I like what's happening. Uh, some of you ladies, you like you paint or you create crafts. It's the same idea here. David said, I muse at the work of thy hands. And you begin with a plan, you have a vision, and you manifest it with your hands. And, you know, there's a great gratification and satisfaction. Might even be a little bit of pride involved. It ought to be if it's worthwhile. Don't take that wrong. God gives us the abilities to do it. But it might be, it might even, you ought to be proud of it. You know, have a little pride involved with that finishing product, finished product. Uh, you know, before I went to work at Modine, I was there 27 years, and which I was by trade a machinist. I, I did a little bit of everything over there. But for 10 years, I worked for a company in Roanoke. I was a tool maker. And, uh, you know, uh, I had gone to a tech school for that. And that was really the vocation that where God had placed me. I just had a natural ability that that he give to me to be able to do that work and i made intricate precision mechanisms using various machines you know tools steels processes sometimes working down into tolerances of two ten thousandths of an inch 
And, uh, you know, this, this process would begin with an engineer would bring me the drawings of whatever it was that he wanted made. And uh, back in those days, these were just 2D drawings. Some of y'all might know what I'm talking, two-dimensional. They was just a bunch of lines and numbers on a piece of paper. Nowadays, you can bring it up on a computer, and it's a three-dimensional model, and you can roll this thing around, look at it, and you know what it's like. But back then, I would have to take these prints and sometimes study them for hours just to get in my head what it looks like. You see what I'm saying? God's got this plan from eternity past, and he's already holding it out there looking at it, and he knows where it's headed, and he knows every little bit of detail. But, you know, I'd get this thing, and once I got it in my head, I could see it, and I could see where it was headed. You know, I knew what it was going to be. And, and you know, I'd have to plan the order of operations, and I'd go pull the material off of the stock, you know, pull the steel, and uh, and... I began sawing, you know, rough cutting and sawing and things like that. And I couldn't get ahead of myself. It had to be in order. If I'd get ahead of myself, it's kind of like a guy, Paul, uh, sawing off a limb you're standing on on a tree. You know, if you know, if you'd messed up along the way, you just couldn't progress on. And so there had to be an intricate order to it. You know, I began to rough this thing in. And it was some of it, I might get to a point that I'd have to send it out to heat treat and then have it harden and it would come back and I'd begin to do some finish work to it. And all the while, I could see it in my mind what this thing was going to look like. And the closer I got to the end of it, the more ownership that I took of it. You know, once that, once that come in my mind, yeah. you know... Once I got a picture in my mind of what it looked like, I already had the ownership of it. It was, it was mine. It belonged to me. And that was the way that I approached it as I was making this stuff. And, and during the process of machining the part, the further along I got, you know, really the more proud I felt. The more proud I was of what I was doing. You know, I just didn't want it to work right. I just didn't want it to serve a purpose. I wanted it to be perfect. And, you know, I'd take this thing, I'd get done and take it to the tool crib and they'd assign a tooling number to it and put it in inventory. And uh, I wanted people to walk by and say, I know who made that. But y'all get what I'm saying? I'm not, that's a weak fleshly illustration and I'm not bragging on myself. I thank God for what he's allowed me to do and to be a part of. But the intricacies of him being a skilled artisan in putting together this body of Christ. Oh, it's nothing by accident. And, and again, that's, that is a weak fleshly illustration. But you know, he loves his church, his bride. And there's no happenstance involving any little part of it. It's no wonder that Paul said in, in 2 verse 10, he says, for ye are God's masterpiece. We're his workmanship. Created in Christ Jesus under good works, which God has before ordained that you should walk in them. You know, our style of life, it was preordained before the world began. Amen. I'm sorry for running over so long, but I'll try to shorten these up a little bit. <clears throat> God's good. Yeah, this is the big thing that he's allowed us to be a part of. He called us into it. Let's pray. Thank you for spending the time with us at the Blue Ridge Baptist Church YouTube channel. And while you're here, please select from our playlist previous messages from both our pastor, Brother Ralph Coleman, and many other preachers and evangelists. So avail yourself of these ministers of the gospel and share with friends and family. And I know you will both find and be a blessing. And as always, from here at Blue Ridge Baptist Church, to God be the glory. Praise the Lord.